Stephen talked about the philosophy of clustering yesterday, but I'll tell you um, what options and command lines you'll need to do the clustering. And then um, briefly, we'll talk about analyzing the results and modeling them. So comparative modeling um, is when you want to construct a atomic resolution model of a protein, but you don't know what the structure is experimentally. So you have a sequence of your protein, um, but you do not have a structure. And um, what it involves is um, this, what we will, you'll call that this your target protein here, the one where you need the model of. Um, and in comparative modeling, you use a template, and that template comes from um, the protein ba data bank, an experimentally determined structure. And what you can do is use that template with your target sequence and produce a model of your protein. And often these terms are, are used synonymously, comparative modeling and homo homology modeling. Um, in this tutorial, we're going to consider homology modeling specifically as when you uh, model a protein based on a template with a common evolutionary origin. Um, these templates, there's many different ways you can determine what you want your templates to be. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And then threading is also a term that's often used synonymously with these two terms. In this tutorial, threading will um, specifically be talking about taking these amino acids of your target sequence and placing them onto the coordinates of your template structure. Um, so that is what the um, procedure of threading is in the scope of this tutorial. And there's many applications to these models. Um, you can use them to predict structure-function relationships, predict binding pockets for ligands, um, they're really powerful in suggesting site-directed immunogenesis experiments for experimentalists. Um, so if you can um, create a model of your protein, it really gives you a visual aid to be able to go in and say, I want to try making mutants in this area of the protein because that's where I think the binding side of my ligand is. And um, so th that's what this tool can be used for. So I'm going to show you a video by what I mean about threading, um, and this is a DNA, but this is sort of the idea. So this is the um, template right here, and you're going to see on blue what I mean by placing amino acids onto um, the blue right here is where um, it's threading onto the backbone of the yellow and red template. Um, so you put those um, the sequence on there, and then it's going to do some refinement of the side chain. So that is what um, threading is. modeling is um, identifying what your template structure is going to be. And I'm not going to go into great detail about this. There's a whole you know, philosophy on how to determine good templates uh, in itself that's outside of the scope of this workshop and it's outside of Rosetta itself. You should come to Rosetta with a template in mind. But a few words, your pseudo a suitable template should have at least 30% sequence identity, ideally to the target. Um, especially in the backbone regions, or specifically in the backbone regions. The loops can have a lot of variability. Um, there's two approaches generally. You can use sequence similarity. Um, so if you use BLAST or CYBLAST, um, you take your protein and input it into BLAST, um, it will give you some suggestions of proteins with similar sequence identity or full recognition servers. Um, DALI and FIRE are two full recognition servers that um, they use predicted secondary structure information for your protein to detect uh, proteins that have uh, similar 3D characteristics. And it's not all the time where uh, proteins with similar sequence identity have you know, similar 3D characteristics or vice versa. And so it's always good to you know, use a variety of methods to identify a good template. So this is the general protocol um, that you use you first start with um, an alignment between your target and your template structure. This is a very important step because this determines um, what amino acids of your target will be threaded onto your template. And there's a lot of you know ideas about sequence alignment as well. And I'm sure most of you have um, 
used different sequence alignment tools before. There's um, BLAST is a, the sequence alignment. Um, Clustal W the sequence alignment. Um, we work on one in our lab called BCL Align. So there's a lot of different sequence alignment methods. Um, I, in the tutorial I'm giving you, um, we're going to use Clustal just because a lot of developers in Rosetta use Clustal W. So. Um, and then um, the threading step. You take those you take your template structure and then you thread the amino acids onto the template base just for the backbone regions. And then you do a um, rebuilding of the loop regions. Um, so those are the pink areas in between the secondary structure elements. And then finally a full atom refinement of the entire model with the side chains. And then you will want to cluster your models and analyze your results. Um, so this is just the general protocol for comparative modeling. So with Rosetta, what um, it will do most of these steps for you as long as you provide the correct input files. So you will provide the target sequence, um, your template PDB, and these are the names of the proteins in your step-by-step um, -step instructions later. You will provide fragment files. Um, an alignment of the target and template sequences, and then optionally you can provide a secondary structure file if you would like to. And then it outputs a silent file that contains some of your models and the corresponding scores. So I'll go through each of these inputs um, in more detail. You, of course, need to have your um, target sequence, and you can um, go to the um, NCBI website to find your sequence if you don't have it already. Um, you um, go to the website for the PDB to find the um, coordinates of your, uh, to, to find the PDB file for your template. And you will want to definitely clean your PDB the way that Stephen talked about yesterday with the clean PDB script, um, especially for comparative modeling. It's going to make your life a lot easier if you remove the clashes to begin with. Um, you will want to have fragment files because this protocol uses a uh, fragment-based loop building, so that is why you need uh, your fragment file files, and Stephanie talked about that already. Finally, you would um, want your alignment, um, and like I said, there's multiple methods. Um, you can use cluster W, or you can use whatever method you want. And oftentimes, I will look, go into the alignment and um, manually adjust um, any regions that I see fit um, based on what, what I usually do is I will um, choose a variety of templates and then do a structural alignment of all of those templates. And then I take my um, target and I do an alignment with all related proteins from different species, you know, so I have evolutionary information in that, and do a sequence alignment of all of my, a variety of templates, and then do a profile, profile alignment of all of those templates with all of those targets. And then take a really careful look at my alignment and then I will manually adjust based on anything that I see glaring. Um, you don't want to do too much manual adjustment unless you have experimental data to prove so. Um, but the sequence alignment is just really important, and that's why I'm emphasizing it so much, um, even though it's just one step of this process. Um, and then you can provide secondary structure information. Um, SciPred works really well for me, and so um, I recommend using SciPred. Finally, this is what your options file looks like. Um, so um, unlike um, some of the just application-based, um, single application-based um, protocols that we'll be talking about today and maybe you're used to using, this protocol um, uses several different um, applications. And so you will be running a general mini Rosetta application that calls um, the loop building application calls the relax application. So um, you start by specifying that you want the threading protocol. Um, and then you uh, specify all of your input files that I've already talked about. These are the options for the loop building. And I'll talk a little bit more about loop building um, in a bit. But you specify um, your fragment sizes, the fragment files, um, that you want to use quick CCD is the type of um, loop building that works best for homology modeling. Um, you want to um, specify to idealize um, the loops after they close. Um, 
loops extended allows you to um, rebuild the loops entirely, which is preferred for, um, I like to do it for homology modeling just because loop regions are very variable. Um, so I don't necessarily trust the loop regions in my template. Um, and then this flag also does the same. It, it allows you to, it removes the missing densities and then builds in the loops for you. Um, and then you want to relax the loops. And then you can set a minimum loop size. And so I usually set mine to four. I only want um, Rosetta to consider um, loops that are four residues or closer. And then finally, um, you specify your output files. Um, so how many structures you want to build. Um, again, the more, the better. Um, that you want to output into a silent file, the name of your silent file, and then it'll be full we'll added because you are doing a relaxed step in this protocol. And then you run Rosetta, and you've done this before. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of people had trouble running the command line. Um, so you specify the name of your application. Um, in this case, it's going to be a Rose, mini Rosetta. You specify, um, you put an at symbol, and then you specify the name of your options file, <coughs> the path in the name of your options file. You specify um, the database. Um, if you want to use this environment variable, you need to specify the path of your database in your command line and then you output to a log file. So in this, when, when you push go, when you run this command, Rosetta is doing these three steps for you. It's doing the threading, it's rebuilding the loops, and then doing the full um, <coughs> atom refinement um, all in one step for each of the structures that you want to build. And so this is actually an improvement in the release. Previously, um, these steps had to be done separately, but now these steps can all be done together very easily. So. Okay, so I'm going to switch to loop building, unless anybody has any questions about comparative modeling. Yeah. So, in a comparative modeling, can you also incorporate some of the experiment data, like NMR data, into the program? Yeah, so you can, like, ex like experimental restraints? Yeah. Yes, you can. You can. Um, I specify, um, I use, I, I specify disulfide bonds that I know form when I do comparative modeling. Um, I don't use constraint files, but I'm pretty sure that you can um, use a constraint files just like Stephanie um, talked about for hers. So, mm -hmm. so what's the, the command tag, the option, how to define a disulfide or want to keep it from the template? For the disulfide? No, I, um, I, I, I can write that on okay. the board. Okay. Yeah, I'll write that on the board for you. So if you have a ligand in your template, can you incorporate that in your uh, model also? Or how do you do that? So um, for ligands, um, I usually do it in two steps. Um, personally, I will build the model. And then what I do is I take the model and my template from before, and I will superimpose them. And then I will do the ligand docking based on that placement of that ligand. Um, so you do docking? Uh, so I do, mm -hmm. I do. Um, and I use the um, template that with with the ligand as my initial placement. Yeah, and Gordon will talk more about that. Um, if you do comparative modeling and you have the disulfide bridge, it will automatically detect a neutral bridge. Or it will it will it will um, put a heavier weight on models that conserve that disulfide. It just acts as a distance restraint. Um, so the membrane avenue, th those constraint files are a lot more sophisticated. And they, you know, you're able to define different functions that you want to use to um, for for those restraints. The disulfide bond really purely is just like, you know, I want to conserve like the distance between these two. A disulfide bond between these two is much more. Uh, less sophisticated. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk. Oh, go ahead. Um, in the first file that we created, yep. there is no any gap, right? But they usually in the second slide, you think that is some gap. Yes, yes. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, usually or hopefully, those gaps are occurring in the loop regions. And those are the regions. That um, are going to be rebuilt. We have very big problems for this. For example, if you have a gap between around 